I get away? Ah, I have one more comment, sorry. We are going to be filming all of the lectures, so, um, and then we, we have a, a YouTube channel where we post these. So if you don't want that, uh, just let us know. Um, and you can decide after your talk. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you all here with the first talk today for Quilt. I've been working on diagnosing gate failures in quantum circuits using machine learning techniques along with my high school student, Alan Rogers, who was just introduced. So this project, just a quick overview of the talk. Looks like you're still working. Okay. Quick overview of the talk. We're going to start with a quick motivation and the problem statement because this is a, a project that's just getting started. We want to be very clear about how we're addressing our problem, and how we're going about finding these circuit failures. I'm then gonna do an overview of the machine learning approach that we're using, followed by our current results, and then the current work we have to follow up on those results. And then finally, sum it all up with an end sort of outlook on what we're gonna do in the future. So first of all, our motivation is, in the current day, we're moving closer and closer to having some sort of realizable quantum computer if not universal, a small scale, like the one provided by IBM and the one that Google has. So these things are slowly becoming realizable, but they're really faulty. So all of these circuits need to have some way that if something breaks, that you're able to identify what is broken. Now, a lot of quantum control and quantum error correction protocols are really useful in this near-term quantum computing at diagnosing how to fix the errors, assuming you already know what's gone wrong. So here we want to provide that pre-processing step to identify what went wrong in the first place. So in particular, we want to consider examples of circuits that can be widely different in their construction. So as simple as a bell state circuit, which is just two gates essentially, to something really complicated like this quantum repeater circuit that was proposed by so we're looking at circuits that can have a wide variety of number of qubits, wide variety in the number of gates, and yet still be useful for all of these applications. So we're proposing a hybrid quantum classical machine learning algorithm that can classify a faulty gate. And I'm going to talk more in detail about how I'm hybridizing these two approaches using both quantum machine learning and classical machine learning, but in both of these cases, we're using the KNN approach, a K nearest neighbors approach, which I'm going to go into more detail on. But first, let's establish what exactly we're addressing. We're considering multi-qubit circuits with many gates. So again, decently complicated circuits. Our end goal is to get up to about 60 qubits because that is what is currently realizable using IBM's computer, which is the easiest one for researchers to get time on and sort of program at this point. We're also dealing with the assumption that we have complete knowledge of the circuit design. You know, we're not going to help you figure out some unknown circuit uh, so you can break it. We're assuming that this is a tool that you're going to use if you have a chip or something that isn't performing the way you want, but you don't want to ruin your whole lab setup to try and fix whatever the problem is, right? We also assume at this point that we have complete control over the input states to the circuit, but I have this marked as temporary because I don't think that this is an assumption we're gonna carry all the way through. Most people have their uh, state creation already set up and we're gonna move away from having that complete input control, but right now we're just trying to establish what we can do if we have more control over the system. We're also gonna assume only one gate is failing at a time because before you can find a variety of failures, you should at least be able to find one. And finally, we're going to assume that all gate failures can be modeled as a physical defect. So an unintended phase shift, an unintended rotation, if you're doing like an optical setup, maybe uh, you have a beam splitter that's transmissivity is not quite white, right, something like that, but not quite considering fault yet. But yes, anything that you can model using a physical defect. So moving into the machine learning that we're doing, we're 
using KNN, which classically is something like baby's first machine learning technique. It's a very simple type of machine learning that's really good for classifications if you have non-binary classifications. So there are better ones to use if you only have two categories, but if you have a large circuit with many different gates in it, you can't simplify that into a binary classification. So in this case, this is the simplest type of machine learning you can use to classify a variety of different cases. And the way it works is that you have a set of training data that consists of vectors. So in this case, the training data in two dimensions is the squares and the triangles. And each vector has a category assigned to it. And then that is it as far as training data. It's a non-dynamic sort of training data. Once it's set, it's set and exists forever. Then you take a new point to test it. You plop it in your vector space. So in theory, this vector space can be in-dimensional. Uh, K and N scale really well with dimensionality. But in this case, again, for proof of concept, we're looking at two dimensions. So you place it and you look for the closest points using a Euclidean distance or a dot product and taking K of those nearest neighbors. So in this smaller circle, K would be three. So your three nearest neighbors, look at what the majority classification is give that classification to your unknown point. And you can change this classification by changing K. That's the real art of the machine learning process to give you more accuracy. So if you move to five nearest neighbor neighbors, you move to that dotted line and the classification changes with the squares. So that's sort of how you optimize your accuracy using K nearest neighbors. Uh, so again, training, important thing here is that it's non-dynamic once you have your training vectors they're set and your testing is as simple as plotting a point checking what's near it and then after doing this very many times and determining your category that way check your accuracy at the end you want a pointer that would actually help a lot okay But there is a, an approach that was proposed by a group at Microsoft for doing something like this using a quantum circuit. So the group at Microsoft was looking at encoding a classical bit into quantum states and then using the difference between two bits, uh, the Euclidean distance between two bits, use, uh, using a model of the fidelity for that. So essentially how this gate, this circuit works that they propose is you have two of your states which have information about the, the different points that you want to take the distance between and an ancillary bit. And the probability of measuring that ancillary bit to be zero has to do with the fidelity between those two qubits. And this is analogous to the Euclidean distance, but a distance almost between qubits. And they wanted to use this just for doing a quicker K and N than a classical computer can do using only classical zeros and ones, right? However, there is nothing in this that assumes that you're you only using classical bits. You can use this approach for a fully quantum uh, state comparison, essentially. However, there are a few issues with this as far as our purposes go. Number one is that we want to do multi-qubit circuits. We want these circuits to get pretty complicated up to 16 qubits because you know that's what IBM says they have. So only comparing two qubits at a time is a little bit of an issue. But the bigger problem is that we're doing K and N. So remember that I said that that training data doesn't change. So you're supposed to have the same vector for all of your training data every time you classify a new point. So if you do a fully quantum realization of this, that means you'd have to have access to hundreds of quantum states on demand, which is a very almost unreasonable thing to require because we don't really have a quantum memory at this time. We can't just store these qubits. And if you're constantly recreating them, that is a, a big source of fault. And you have to have hundreds of these because most machine learning techniques require hundreds at least points of training data, if not thousands. So that's a big problem to address. 
So when we unite these things, we're trying to, overall, the idea that I want to do is to create something that I can use for a classical pane and I can store classically, but that encodes some of that quantum distance that we're seeing in the quantum pain and circuit. So in this case, we assume you have, this is your initial circuit with some in number of qubits, right? And you have some reference state here. And it doesn't matter what your reference state is. Well, it does matter. We're going to get to that more in a bit. But essentially, you have a reference state, and you want it to be the same for all of your circuits that you're testing and classifying. And you use this modified version of their circuit as a sort of diagnostic circuit. So instead, essentially, you're repeating that correcting gate, all controlled on that same ancillary qubit. And that gives you a new probability of measuring zero in that ancillary qubit that works as a sort of distance between the entire state of the circuit and a reference state that you're using. And that outputs a probability. And that probability is a classical number. So you can then store that probability one time in a classical vector and hold on to that using classical memory and use that as your new point of classification. However, this also allows us to gain a new degree of optimization that we can consider is if you have more than one reference state, then you can take this probability many times. So we consider a series of reference states uh, to, perform, to get a sort of d-dimensional vector. So assume you have some circuit, one gate goes wrong, and you essentially take the difference between that and four different reference states, and those become your new vector coordinates used for classification. And just like, real quick, I keep forgetting this is not plugged into my computer. <laughs> so real quick recap, when I say vector, you that You can way, plug it in. I can, but I don't know how. Um, here. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so all that goes. So when I'm saying vector, I feel like that might get a little bit esoteric. So just quick recap. The vectors in this case are the points that you're plotting in your K and N algorithm. They're populating the vector space and they're establishing the categories that you're going to use to categorize new points. So the higher dimensionality you make your vector space, the more room there is for classifying different categories. So if you want to do a circuit of 30 gates, that's 30 categories, you're going to need a lot of space to do that. So I have a question. Yes. Can you go back um, one more? Can you clarify what sigma and rho i are? Yeah, so in this case, sigma is the symbol that I use for the output state of the circuit. Okay. And rho i is the reference state. So it's the, we consider a set of reference states to populate each vector. So rho i would go over each of those reference states. And in practice, sigma would be set for whatever the output is of the circuit that is uh, erroneous. However, currently we're assuming that we have complete control over this input state. So in principle, sigma also can be iterated to have the same input as the uh, reference state. And Q0 through Qn is a classical bit string? Not necessarily. It okay. can be, ah. uh, but there's nothing implicit that requires that. However, we do require that you can write it completely in the logical basis, so all mm -hmm. pure states. Okay, and then u is u like u i corresponding to a row i. Ah, so that's a good point. So u i it is essentially just what you said. It's whatever units here we're using to establish our reference state. Okay. So giving a few more details on how we're actually using this, we're considering a four-dimensional vector, which means that for any one error in a gate, we compare the output state of that circuit with four reference states to populate each individual vector that we put in our training data. And the way we're doing this is this is changing this u, essentially, and changing this set 
of input vectors. And the two choices that we've currently been playing around with are making you a Hadamard and making you a quantum Fourier transform. So preliminary results, and I should have a caveat here, is that this is very beginning of the project. So we really do need to take a lot more data to smooth out some of these lines. But just to give you an idea of some of our early results that we're seeing doing testing with this classification method, um, first of all, one of the things we're looking for <coughs> is stability of the reference state. So at a certain number of qubits, does the accuracy scale reasonably or does it at least give a consistent result for the same dimensions of circuits? And you see very quickly that Hadamard actually is not a very stable reference state to use, but if you make just a slight switch to the QFT, um, depending on the input states, you get an accuracy that's much more stable above 90%. And above 90% is sort of the goal with machine learning to be better than a human. So one of the other things we're considering is the initial state that you put into the reference uh, circuit. So the difference between that yellow line and that green line is essentially how many states are initially one. So the green line has an input state where they're all essentially zero, and the yellow line has input states that have a variety of states that start off initialized as one. And we're seeing that that makes a difference. Additionally, we're seeing a high amount of stability with the gate numbers. So for this is, I believe, six qubits. Yes, so this is, for six qubits, if you go up to about 30 gates, for all references, you get over 90% accuracy. And so part of the reason that this might be the case is that parameterization of the vector space. Every time we add a new gate, we also add a new category. And since we're only considering the points that are closest to any new point, we're essentially carving up our space more and more tightly every time we add a new gate. So we're maintaining a high degree of accuracy even when you add very many gates to a circuit. So that's all well and good, but these are random circuits that I was talking about. And I wanted to look at an example in practice. So that quantum repeater circuit that was proposed in another paper, just as a for instance. Um, so that is about four qubits. And 30 gates with some simplification. And with a random circuit of those parameters, we were seeing about 99% accuracy with classification, assuming we had perfect input control. And for the quantum repeater in particular, we saw about 95% with input control. And why might that be? Well, first of all, some circuits are harder to classify than others. And you might notice there's only two types of gates in this circuit, which is very uniform as far as KNN is concerned. So it's the thing that our classification method with struggles with the most is telling the difference between where a gate is placed in the circuit. So we're not just happy if it tells us something that broke was a Hadamard. We want it to tell us where in the circuit the Hadamard that broke is placed. So the fact that there are so many of these Hadamards adds a degree of confusion the network. So we dropped down to about 95% with input control, but you might notice if you look at the circuit, it does not call for an arbitrary input. It calls for input of all zeros. So we wanted to look at it without input control, and we're starting to see that initial dependence on that input control, that we are dropping down to about 80% max with a change in parameters when using the quantum Fourier transform comparison state. So this is still decent, right? Because this is four qubits, 30 gates, 80% of the time we're still right. That's not bad at all. However, it's certainly not 99% accurate, right? So this is something that we're gonna be trying to inch ever closer, mostly by optimizing over parameters. However, that brings me into my next issue, which is what I, a little problem I like to call the parameter problem. So KNN, allows for us to have many degrees of freedom to optimize our learning approach. And this is almost a bit overwhelming because many of these need to be optimized. And currently, we're choosing things that happen to work without 
motivating them, and that is definitely something we need to continue. So for instance, K, which is probably the most important parameter, we're setting that to five, but quickly running through some calculations, we see that nine is probably better for long circuits like the quantum repeater. Additionally, we're looking at population. So when I say population, that's for every different category, how many training points you put in that, that category to start off with. So in the case of the quantum repeater, every single gate has 200 different variations of how that gate can go wrong in our classification method. And that might sound like a lot, but many computer science people will actually tell you that machine learning techniques often have thousands of training points. So we might have to bring this up and then we run into the problem of overfitting data. So that is something that we'll have to optimize over. Um, training test split is, again, more of a computer science issue. Most uh, machine learning algorithms are trained using 80% split. We've only been using 60%. So we could arguably use more of our training data instead of just testing with it. But the big one is the number of comparison states. We're using four apropos of nothing. We just picked four because four seemed like a good starting point. We don't want to start with one, right? Because that's a one dimensional fit. And that's just logically highly prone to errors. And four seems to do really well for our random circuit classification, but I want to motivate this. I want to find how many reference states are necessary for any given circuit. And in high probability, this will be very dependent on the type of circuit we're looking at, which means that this will likely need an additional step of machine learning to optimize over that, probably something a little bit more complicated, like neural networks and things like that. So just to quickly run over that all, over, all again, I know I've talked pretty fast to begin with, I'm gonna slow down now. So we're using K nearest neighbors, a fairly simple machine learning technique to show that we can find faulty gates in circuits, even with high numbers of qubits and many, many gates. So in this case, we were able to get results of 10 or 11 qubits and up to 30 gates in a circuit, which as far as beginning preliminary results is very heartening for us. But we still have a lot to do in this project. Uh, this has essentially been my summer project with my high school students. Um, so we still need, we need to collect a lot of data, smooth out some of those lines so we can see the relationship of things as they propagate outward. We need to remove the input control assumption because if the end goal is to create something someone can use like in a lab or on a chip for diagnostics, you don't want to have them break up their setup even for input control. So we're going to try and address the input control assumption to be more friendly to actual implementation. We're gonna define some optimal comparison states and we're gonna switch our coding programming language, which might seem like a small thing to do, but it's actually a really huge problem when you're dealing with code that's written in Python, but you're doing something that is very computationally expensive. Python has like no memory convenient allocation setup whatsoever. So that's something big to do. But the big takeaway from here is that preliminary results show that we should be able to classify false end gates even with large circuits in a 